Good morning, Restore Community Church. I'm so glad to be with you again. It feels like we've been apart for a long time. Uh, for those of you, maybe this is our first time meeting. My name is Dustin Pruitt. I'm, a, I'm a, one of the ministers here at Restore Community Church, and it is my pleasure to be bringing you the, the next point in our messy church series. I feel like there's almost no series that's better put, better placed, better timing for today than a church about, or a series about how the church can be messy. Because I know our lives can be messy. The situations we find ourselves in can be messy. Our circumstances are messy. If anybody's life is truly the straight and narrow and, and pristine and clean, can I take notes? Can, can you share the wisdom? Uh, because the wisdom we're going to be getting in today uh, is, is from Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Uh, and specifically today, we're going to be focusing on 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and as I was reading this passage and, and preparing for our talk, uh, it, it's kind of a chunky bit of passage. It's, a, it's 14 verses and 15 verses. And I'm actually going to read them here up top. And I'm going to be referring back to it as we go because I, it, it's such a fascinating block of text. The, what, what has been fit in here, you, you get to see some of the personality of Paul, but also, also and obviously the wisdom and word of God mixed in here. I, I think it's so interesting. So I'm going to read and, and we'll move on in. So once again, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm starting in verse 1. It says, I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. So I do not think that I am in the least inferior to these super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We may have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anybody. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. But I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do, because I do not love you? God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. I mean, Paul is, his pen must be on fire as he's writing this down. It's so amazing that he's, from starters, I love the first line where it says, 
I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. He's like, guys, I kind of wish I didn't have to talk about this. It's even silly that I have to bring it up, but I'm going to bring it up. Will, will, you give me a, will you give me a second? Because I got to bring it up. I really wish I didn't have to. It's kind of foolish, but I got to. That Paul is defending himself against some challenges of false apostles that have come. Paul's been to Corinth. He, he's taught, he's brought the word of God, he brought with him the, the knowledge of the baptism of the Spirit and baptism in Christ. And he's gone on his way, and now he's writing back. And when he went on his way, some, some false prophets have st stood up, taking his place, and they, they started saying some things. And it's apparently some of these Corinthians have been persuaded that Paul, act, Paul, Paul, the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, that, that God changed uh, uh, in the middle of the road from Saul to Paul, a miraculous moment, going signs that Paul himself is not even a legitimate apostle. And why? What, what, for one thing, that Paul isn't as strong or as impressive as they are. His, his oratory skills aren't as polished. He, his jokes aren't landing. His points aren't as eloquently put. They don't, it's not that reverse something like if 1 plus 2 equals 3, then 2 plus 1 equals that reverse that people can do if, if it rhymes. If you don't have observation, how can you have consideration this rhetoric, Paul didn't have the rhetoric, he, so he can't be a good apostle. He doesn't sound as good as I do. He doesn't sound as good as this guy. We're both, we both say we're apostles. And so the culture of the day that, that had settled in Corinth associated performance, associated speaking skills with wisdom. That if Paul himself wasn't impressive, then how can we trust his teaching? How can we trust what he's saying? And that Paul starts defending himself. He, he feels foolish that he's got to defend himself. And first, he, he asks the Corinthians to bear with this foolishness. He seems that he's uncomfortable with it. And that ultimately, though, this foolishness is about defending Christ. It's not his reputation so much, but the person he's representing, defending Christ from these false teachings in Corinth. That he makes no attempt to proclaim that, yo, my man, if you just listen, I got the oratory skills. If you just listen, I am wise. I got, I'm smarter than you are, so you should listen to me. That's not what Paul's saying. Rather, he points to all the hardships he's been through, that he's been able to endure only because of Christ. That in this, this is his second letter to Corinth. He, he addresses this dangerous situation that's taking group within the church, and that's the influences of false prophets. So I'm, I'm sounding like this is an ancient issue and that I'm going to be talking mainly about the church in Corinth because today we definitely don't have that issue, do we, guys? I'm, I'm sure you can't think of many people, as, especially as me as an American standing here, and def America definitely doesn't have a problem with false prophets. So I, I, I can't really speak from experience here. Or, or does that joke not land? And you realize that I feel like America, my homeland, has made a home for false prophets. We've, we've opened our arms. Come right on in. Lead us astray, please. That many, and it's not just America, it's worldwide. This is, this is worldwide, are drawn to powerful orators that, that charisma, that they got the smile, the gleam in their eye. That they come on and they say things and they they're, they're just like 5% off. Just 5 it, We'll dive into that. We'll dive into that. So they're drawn to these orators, to these... It's such a strange phrase. A super apostle, the, the NIV says here. The, the elitist apostles or the chiefliest apostles 
Uh, other translations say, and that's, that's Paul saying, that's God saying through Paul, the idea that there are tears, that you got apostles and you got mid apostles and you got super apostles, chiefly apostles, is so outlandish that anybody coming to you and saying there's tears, that this guy's here, but this guy's up here, that message is broken. You can't trust the person giving it. So the idea of super apostles, but, but Paul, he comes in in his defense and he gives us such a radical different picture of what true apostolic leadership looks like. That he doesn't defend his credibility, his wisdom, by boasting of his achievements. My, guys, if you've seen the healings I've done, the demons I've cast out, this speech that I gave, the thousands that have given their life to Christ, let me, let me show you my CV. It said Paul points to humility, to sacrificial service, and even his weaknesses as a true mark of his leadership. And I just think that's so, so interesting. So let's start there. Uh, one of these marks of a false prophet to be set aside from a true apostle, a true follower of God is this freedom from the love of money. The Bible has talked about that the love of money is, is the first sin, is the root of all sin. This love of power. That money, money can give us its, its power, its financial power, its buying power. It, it, it can give us freedom in different ways, a, a, a form of freedom. And that Paul begins his defense by reminding the Corinthians that he preached the gospel to them free of charge. He didn't ask for money. He didn't use his ministry as a way to enrich himself. In fact, he even says he went out of his way to avoid being a financial burden to the church in Corinth. Like, look, I, I robbed other churches. I feel like I've robbed because they gave me sustenance. They gave me food, clothing, shelter, and money to go on my travels. I'm doing this for free for Corinth. Macedonia is footing the bill. I'm not asking you for, for nice things. I'm not, oh man, I'd love, you see that ring in the market? I'd love that ring. If I had that ring, there's so many things I could do for you. If you just did this for me, I could do this for you. And I think this stands as a stark contrast to a false apostle who is likely and ultimately motivated by personal gain what do I get out of this? What, what, can I, what can build up my kingdom, my name? A little bit of extra, extra cash. Maybe, maybe a fancy car out in the car park. Is that for me? Oh, you bought me a new watch? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Let me, let me bless you real quick. I'll pray for you real quickly. But his refusal to take money from the Corinthians, it's... It wasn't about avoiding scandal, the heart issue of it. It was about ensuring that his ministry was free from all accusations of greed or self-interest. This reminds us of the qualifications that Paul gives in his, his in, bleh, that Paul gives for the church leaders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, that they must be, quote, free from the love of money. All leaders, and wherever you're sitting now, if you're driving in your car, if you're sitting on your sofa in your bed, watching this, listening to this, you are a leader in the church. Whether you know it or not, God has called each and every one of us to be leaders, and he's called us to be free from the love of money. And this is a crucial point for anyone but especially those in church leadership, whether it's no matter the context, that true leaders are not in it for personal gain, aren't in it for what can I get, aren't in it for can this make my life cushier, aren't in it, can this enrich me and give me an, a pension. You know, they're not in it for that. Not in it for wealth or benefits that come with a position. Instead, their focus is on serving others and advancing the kingdom of God. 
Paul says at time uh, over his writing that he serves people. Paul doesn't say he comes and he leads people. Paul says he serves people. That is a leader. And our false prophets of today, so many we can think about. I, I, I have an image of one in my head that, can you, can you help, can you give me money? Can, can you help me out with, with my nice watch? Can you help me out with this? Because I, I want to do that. So could you give me something so I could do that? You know, if you gave me some money, I'd bless you. If you gave me some money, I'd pray. If you gave me some money, I'd work. Where a true servant of God isn't about the paycheck. It's about the serving. It's about the God behind it all. And that Paul's example is meant to challenge us. That a true leader is marked by generosity and integrity and a heart that is free from this, this self-edification, building up your, your storehouse and your treasures. And that Paul went to great lengths to ensure his ministry remained above reproach, not even a hint of reproach, above it all. And we too need to guard our hearts against this. Now, uh, I, I'm going to take a quick uh, uh, left-hand turn before we move on here. This isn't saying you shouldn't tithe, you shouldn't give offerings. So many times the Bible talks about the, this love of money, but also giving to the storehouse, but also being a cheerful giver. Uh, the, no topic that Jesus talked about more than than this. So it's finding that balance. It's finding that, let me tell you, me, I'm not in this for the money. Ian, Ian's not in this for the money. Jew, Jew isn't in this for the money. Simon, Simon's not in this for the money. Malcolm, we're not in this for the money. And if we were, I pray that we would have a fellowship, that we would have brothers and sisters that could come and give us a kind word of correction. If you start seeing me flour, I, 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 the American vernacular I would say is flaunting some, some money, some nice jewelry. Ooh, you got a nice, I keep saying watch, a nice watch. I got a chain, gold chain all of a sudden. It's not about that. It's not about the name of Dustin. It's about the name of Jesus. A second mark of a true apostle, a true leader, is sacrificial service and willingness to endure the suffering of a sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. That Paul's ministry was characterized by hardship, and he makes no effort to hide this. He's not trying to be a whitewashed tomb. Hey, I got it all together, guys. My life is sunshine and buttercups and rainbows. He's, he's open. Life is hard. Me, uh, Paul, I walk and, and miracles happen. That I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and come, people come find salvation in Christ daily. Man, life is hard. Have you ever been in prison, guys? <laughs> Prison's rough. But Paul's ministry was characterized by this hardship and his lack of hiding. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 28, Paul lists his many trials that he endured, being beaten, imprisoned, shipwrecked, constant danger, and often without food or sleep. That these aren't the kind of accomplishments you, you boast over. Guys, can, you'll never get it. Be prepared to be jealous. I slept one hour last night. Can you believe it? I know you wish you had this lifestyle, but your boy Paul here, we got about a, a full 45 to an hour last night. Oh, you think you, you think you did something? You accomplished something? I barely had enough... Uh, drachma, whatever the money they had at the time, to rub together. I ain't got two pennies to rub together. Paul's not boasting, but he offers him as proof of his leadership, proof that this 
is more important than money. This is more important than sleep. This is more important than any steak dinner. And why, why is this? It, and it's because the sacrificial service, the suffering, are really hallmarks of a leader in the kingdom of God. That false prophets love to come in and talk about their experiences, talk about the healings nonstop, their supposed superiority of, oh, guys, if you had the knowledge I had, guys, if you had the prayer life that I had, guys, if you had the, the ministry I had. But Paul points to his suffering as evidence of his commitment to Christ and the church. That the hardships aren't a weakness. They're not a failure. That they were marks of a servant willing to endure whatever for the gospel. Where, where false apostles will, will walk in saying, hey, I got it all together, guys. It, you roll the red carpet before me. I ain't going to stumble. I didn't stumble on the way here. I got it all together. I've, I'll, I'll talk to you about woes, though I've never lived them. I'll talk to you about your failures because I don't have any of my own. I've never done anything wrong. I'm not going to take responsibility for that because I, I, that's not my fault. I, I've not experienced that. But let me give you the wisdom I got. That's the message of a false prophet. This shiny outside, made up, hair quaffed, whatever way you want to put it. But I got, I ain't done a wrong thing ever. Now they might speak a little more eloquently than that. So just as Christ humbled himself for our sake, and just as Paul lived a life of humility, a, a true leader serves others even when it costs us. Even when it's difficult, beyond when it's easy to serve, beyond when it's easy to give, in the face of hardship, a true leader serves. And, and to pair with that, I think a third mark of a true leader is that boasting in that weakness. And this is perhaps one of the most countercultural aspects of Paul's message that while false prophets were boasting about their strength, oh, my ministry, if you just had my ministry, my prayer ministry, all the people I heal, all the things that I can do, their spiritual experiences, their status. Man, I'm up here. I got that PhD. I got that doctorate. I got that master's of divinity. I'm certain I'm this position at my job. I got this car in the driveway. Paul takes a different approach. He says this in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30. If I must boast, if I have to, if you're going to twist my arm and I got to do it, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. That Paul understood that it is weaknesses that God's power has most clearly displayed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 now, Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, that a weakness or an affliction that he prayed for God to remove. But God's response to him was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power was made perfect in weakness. He goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. What a statement to be in the midst, of standing in the midst of your weakness and saying, this is where God is strong. This is where God's grace resides. That seems so illogical. But in a culture that often celebrates only strength, only success, only self-sufficiency, only the grind, and the win, Paul turns this idea upside down. God, through Paul, turns this idea upside down to embrace your weakness because we know that it's in these moments of weakness that God's grace and his power are more clearly seen, most 
clearly seen. Instead of trying to hide them away, oh, no, everything's okay. No, 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 everything's okay. The marriage is great. The relationship's stronger than ever. You know, all things are, things are good. The, the job's, oh, the job's so easy. My, oh, I got it all together. I'm well rested. You know, I'm, I'm okay, I'm fine. I'm not saying that those things are the idea of if you say those things and you don't mean them, that you are a false prophet. I'm saying you don't need to be ashamed to struggle because the message is we all do. Life is hard. I'm going to say it again. Life is hard. But God's grace and power is there with you in those moments. So hiding them away, sweeping them under the rug, you're sweeping God's grace, you're sweeping God's power, his presence under the rug as well. No, I got it all together. I've got it all figured out. It's in such an important lesson for all of us as we try to cover up our weaknesses, pretending that I've got it all together. The emphasis on I, I got it all together. I've pieced it together. My wisdom, my choices, my intelligence, my charisma, I've got it all figured out. But Paul and God teaches us that it is more than okay to admit our struggles, to embrace limitations and to lean into God because of these weaknesses. That true leadership True Christianity isn't about appearing strong and self-sufficient. It's about acknowledging our dependence on God. That if you got it all together, why do you need God? If you got it all figured out, why do you need God? It's allowing our, this dependence on God and, and His power to work through us. And so another thing that I want to talk about, this, so these are marks, just a few of the marks. I, I feel like we could do a whole series on false prophets. These are just some of the identifying marks of a false prophet, that they come in with their wisdom. And you'll probably encounter false prophets turning on the news when it comes to politics specifically, but also tuning into a podcast tuning into a, a, an online message just like this. And they'll bring you wisdom. And you'll think, oh, I've never heard of it like that before. I've never heard this before. And you can do research and you'll find other people that agree. I'm here to tell you, just because you find all that, it doesn't mean it's right. Part of all this is that you know, Paul speaks about it in the beginning of this chapter, you know, I, I brought you this idea of church. I brought it to you. You know the truth. You know the Holy Spirit. So what about this guy coming in? You know the Bible. We got the Bible in front of us, ladies and gentlemen. You got a phone. You got the Bible. You got a laptop, it's there in front of you. You got a physical Bible, you got a physical Bible. If we're following and allowing influences to come into our life that are extra biblical, man, these are some great life lessons, man. Like this actually kind of goes well if I take this and I marry it with the Bible and I go, this is such a great thing. You have no idea the power that's in this thing. False prophets aren't coming in and saying the Bible's wrong. The false prophets are coming in. If you just change your direction 5%, oh, the places you'll go. Oh, if you just listen to me and this, this wisdom that I have, this convention, this thought, this logic, and you marry it with the Bible, oh, the places you'll go, all the things you'll see. When Paul is coming to the church in Corinth and ultimately to us today, saying the only thing you need to be listening to is the Bible. 
are people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, showing the fruit of the Spirit, that are not boasting in their strength, but boasting in their weakness, that do not love money, but love to serve. So here's my challenge for you. Check your influences. What podcasts are you listening to? What preachers are you listening to? Are are they marrying things together with the word? Are they, oh, you're, you know, this is radical. I'm going off. I'm thinking of certain people in my head and I don't want to speak ill. But we need to be watchful because they're out there. If it happened to Paul in Corinth nearly 2,000 years ago, it's for sure happening today, folks. So let's check ourselves, our heart. There's a verse in the Bible about praying in the book of Revelations, will you you make my lips clean? Father, that I'm not a false apostle. I'm not allowing that teaching into my mind, into my heart. In this world that values wealth and success and strength, what standard am I putting up? Am I trying to gain influence and recognition? Am I trying to gain wealth and and boasting of my accomplishments? Or do I boast of your power and your grace in my weakness? Do I put my head down and you know what? I will clean the toilets. I'll sweep. I'll do whatever you want me to do, God, because I'm serving your kingdom. So let's check ourselves. Let's check our influences, what we allow to speak in. And be on the watch. Because this world's messy. People are messy. That means the church is messy. So let's be do diligent and good stewards of the church to help clean up the mess as much as we can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word that it is alive and breathing today. There's a phrase that goes, there's nothing new under the sun. And my gosh, the problems that they faced then in Corinth, we face yet still today, maybe on a magnitude so much greater. This, This age of the internet where false prophets get more opportunity and more power to speak into our lives across all borders and nationalities and even languages. Father, let us maintain our eyes and our ears on your word, on what follows your word, your spirit, and not charisma, and not logic, Because some of these false prophets, they come in, you know, that, act, that makes a lot of sense, actually. You know, if I thought of it this way, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But Father, it's got to be from you, conform to your word, to your heart, to your spirit. So Father, let us check ourselves, review ourselves, as you are transforming our mind each and every day. In Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. We all say amen and amen. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Tune in next week as we continue our series and journey discussing a messy church. Till then, I'll see you next time. Bye.